The story I'm about to tell happened in the 90s, around 1994. My husband worked in a warehouse that delivered furniture to stores, and I worked cleaning houses. We made okay money from our jobs, but we always lived a bit of a limited life. At least we were able to keep a roof over our heads and food in the fridge. Definitely not rich by any stretch of the means. The family that owned the warehouse that my husband worked for, they were pretty well off. And what was nice was that they had this house up in Big Bear. I cleaned it for them whenever they came back from family outings. Now, whenever that happened, we would have a family outing of our own. They would go there at least four times a year. So that meant we would go four times too. We would always plan it so that we would leave on a Thursday and come back Monday morning. The family knew we did this. It was actually their idea. We'd spend most of our time there relaxing and living it up like we couldn't do at home. Our daughter was young in those days, so I loved the idea of taking her out into nature. The fresh air, the trees, uh, taking her on walks. It was nice. We enjoyed ourselves until the last day before we would leave. On that day, I'd start cleaning. One summer, I had to go clean up the house after a 4th of July party that the family hosted. My daughter was about four or five at this time. We left at noon and got there around seven. The house was three stories tall. The living room and kitchen were on the second floor, with bedrooms in the first and third floors. My daughter's favorite was the first floor because it had a room with a trunk full of toys and board games. The house was pretty secluded with an open backyard that, if you walked far enough, you would eventually reach a lake. You could even see it from the third floor balcony. Anyway, one night, my husband went to bed early, but my daughter couldn't sleep, so I let her play downstairs with some toys. I was upstairs in the living room, watching television, and she comes running into the room, bawling. I asked what was wrong. Was she hurt? But she was scared. She says that she saw something outside her window. That a big dog was growling at her. I told her not to worry. She probably just saw some stray animal. I asked her to show me, but she did not want to. I was surprised to be this honest. My daughter loves animals, but this scary dog really had her shook up. I kissed her, told her to head upstairs to daddy, and I would check it out and make sure it was gone. She went upstairs. I went downstairs. The first floor had a deck out the back, looking over the yard. I slid open the door leading outside and turned on the lights. There was an awful smell out there, like sulfur or urine. Whatever it was, it was strong. It stung the back of my nose. I looked down. I noticed the deck was wet. It hadn't rained for days. But what really got me was what I saw on the deck. Prints. They were kind of like a dog's, but two things stood out. First was just the overall shape. They had the shape of a paw, but much bigger and longer. And secondly, the footprints themselves, well, whatever this was, it wasn't walking on four legs, but on two. I wasn't sure in the dark, but the way they were spaced out didn't look like a dog, like my daughter said. The prints went across the deck and down the steps. I went inside to grab a flashlight. I wanted to check to see if it was trying to get into the garbage cans. I followed the prince to the end of the deck and down the stairs. This is where I saw the ground was damp. I followed the footsteps all the way to the front of the house, where they suddenly stopped. 
I stood there for a while, looking into the dark, listening. And soon, I heard a rumbling above me. I shined my light towards the roof, which sloped down, near to the ground, and saw it there, sitting on the shingles. What I saw had the face similar to a German shepherd, but much bigger. It was dripping water, its ears were upright and sharp, sort of like a bat's, but thinner. The eyes were a bright yellow, almost like hot embers, and it was snarling. I couldn't see it clearly, and thought it might be a rabid dog. So I started yelling, waving my arms around to scare it, hoping that if I pretended to be bigger, that it might run away. Then, this mangy thing stood up on its two hind legs. It towered over me from the roof, like three of me put together. It was angry. Teeth were bared. With my flashlight, I was able to make out its body. It was broad, wide-chested, but it wasn't completely hairy. It was like it had mange, with part of its arm red, like it had been wounded. It was stripped almost completely of hair, and the eyes with the light on them looked like they were glowing. At the moment, I was petrified. I thought I was in a nightmare that a demon from another world was staring me down. It felt like I stood there, frozen for an eternity. Finally, I took a step back, but tripped and fell on my back. The flashlight fell, and I lost all visibility. All I could see was a silhouette from the faint moonlight. I started shuffling backwards, trying not to make any sudden moves that might agitate it, whatever it was. And then, it jumped. And I mean jumped like at least maybe 10, 15 feet in the air, over top of me. It landed behind me and took off. I scrambled up, ran to the front door, and hurried inside as fast as I could, locking the door behind me. I started up the stairs and noticed my daughter coming down to see me. She asked if the scary dog was gone. The whole ordeal left me sweaty and trembling. I told her, yeah, the dog is gone and everything's okay. From that day on, I was scared there. My wife would always ask why I was on the edge when we went to Big Bear. We even had fights about it. Eventually, the arguments stopped when the family sold the house. But what happened there never left my mind. What I saw that day was the stuff of nightmares. A moment that felt so unreal, but real. I know what I saw. When I was in high school, I played on the basketball team and ran track. To keep my cardio up, I used to run this 11 kilometer hiking trail that went through the hills right outside my town. It was a small town. It was safe for the most part and everybody knew each other. I wouldn't call this trail remote, because at certain points you pass a dog park, train tracks, and one stretch of it ran alongside the highway. But some parts were pretty deep into the woods. There was an option to do this 4-kilometer loop inside of this 11-kilometer trail. People travel this route much more often. I hardly ever ran into anybody on the longer trail. I ran this same trail for three years. Nothing strange ever happened. Until this one day. It started off as it normally did. I parked my car on the dirt road that came off of the highway, smoked a joint while queuing songs on my phone. I put my earphones in popped a piece of gum in my mouth and began walking toward the trail. The only thing I took with me on my runs were my phone, earphones, and a single car key wrapped around my index finger. 
I don't recall seeing anybody on the trail that day. It was in the afternoon, and it was not abnormal for the trail to be less busy than it would have been during the evening. I walked for a few minutes while I was still on the crushed stone path. Once you got a little ways into the trail, it turned pretty rugged. Dirt and mud with large tree roots reaching across it in all directions. I liked this trail because I had to focus on where my feet were landing with every step, so I was less focused on how much energy I was exerting. I was about halfway through the 11 kilometer loop, and this was really the most remote part of it. It was all forest. There were a little of hills and dips in the path, big boulders all around you. I did not see or hear anything odd, but out of nowhere, I had this extreme sense of dread creep over me. I kept running, didn't really react. Once I reached a more flat part of the trail, just a few feet ahead, I took my earphones out while keeping the same running pace. I noticed it was eerily silent, but I did not experience a moment where I acknowledged that meant there's likely some sort of predator in the area. The only predators that would have been around me for wildlife would be a coyote, maybe a bear. But this would be very unlikely, as there are never bear sightings anywhere near the town. So I slowed my jog to a walk, and the trail started getting steep, and I had to walk over knee-high rocks. I was still moving fast, because I felt like something was behind me. Now, for some reason, this next part is very hard to remember. Just this slice of about 30 seconds feels almost like I'm trying to recall a dream that I had, but I saw something out in the trees. Now, when I try to remember, I can't fully picture it, almost like looking at a blurry image. It wasn't an animal. It was a person. I can't explain it, but I could clearly sense that it was a male. I pretended not to see the figure in the trees. I remember doing this so they wouldn't know that I was aware of them. It felt subconscious, automatic, and 100% instinctive. The figure wasn't behind me in the way that it felt when I first sensed a presence. It was in front of me, but on my side, my two o'clock to be exact. It didn't move as I walked by. The person just stood there completely still and watched me pass. Once I got up around the turn, probably 15 feet ahead, I ran so fast it was like my feet were going to detach from my body. I remember how weak my knees felt in the sprint, but adrenaline was carrying me out there at a speed that was faster than I've ever moved in my life. I didn't hear the footsteps, but it felt like they were right behind me, as if I would feel two hands reach out and grab me at any moment. A primal fear. I didn't stop running until I was out of the trees and could very visibly see my car. This may feel anticlimactic, but nothing happened when I looked back after leaving the trees. There was no one there. My adrenaline was flooding the entire time, but the deep sense of dread left a couple of minutes after it arrived. I just knew I couldn't stop running until I was out. I think somebody was after me because they saw a five-foot young girl with long blonde hair running alone in the woods. Maybe they were waiting for somebody to pass by, but I have a gut feeling that they were out there for some other reason, and I happened to walk by at the wrong time. I know, it may seem like I just smoked a joint, went into the woods alone and wigged out, but I'd been smoking weed every day for about five years at this point, not proud of how young I was when I started and I did this every single time before I went on a run on that trail, four times a week for three years. 
Nothing like this ever happened to me before or after this run. Although, I did switch trails after two or three more visits. I didn't feel the sense of dread that I felt that day, but I couldn't shake the feeling that it might happen again. Sometimes I wonder if something would have happened to me if I kept running there. I don't live there anymore. I haven't for a while. And I haven't heard of anything bad happening there. But someone was in the woods that day. And they did not have good intentions when they saw me walk by them standing in the trees. Has anybody else ever been out in the woods and experienced this sense of dread without seeing or hearing danger? One Fourth of July weekend in 2011. A buddy of mine that I'll refer to as Todd ended up in a pretty precarious situation. What follows is the story as he told it to me. It was supposed to be a fun weekend up the hill and in the woods at Todd's friend's Troy's cabin. Troy was to introduce Todd to a girl he had also invited over. So naturally, Todd was looking forward to some devious fun for the holiday weekend. As luck had had it, Todd and his new date clicked and soon found themselves downstairs for some alone time fun. Shortly after Todd and his date had disappeared downstairs, Troy decided to go out for a little while. A little while later, as Todd and his date were getting into it, Troy returned to his cabin with some company. Upon hearing foreign voices upstairs, Todd went upstairs to see who was there. To Todd's dismay, he found that Troy had brought someone that he had disliked, a guy named Ace for the sake of the story. Seeing Ace, Todd got angry, and an argument ensued between Todd and Troy while poor Ace stood awkwardly near the doorway. Cue Troy's girlfriend entering only to stand next to Ace with a bewildered expression on her face. Todd had rushed upstairs in his boxers at first, thinking that it was just the guys that had arrived initially, so he and Troy quickly went downstairs to argue further. As Todd and Troy's argument diminished, Troy decided that he, his girlfriend, and Ace would go night swimming at a nearby creek for a while to cool off. For whatever reason, Troy threw on Todd's shorts to swim, which had Todd's keys wallet, and smokes in the pockets. Troy and his company had already been gone for a few moments before Todd realized what had happened. So, Todd and his date continued on downstairs until Troy, Ace, and Troy's girlfriend returned to the cabin. Right as Todd heard them returning, though, he went upstairs to confront Troy, fuming. Todd demanded his shorts back while yelling about his stuff in the pockets during Troy's swim. As the two would argue back and forth for a while, Troy's girlfriend, Todd's date, and Ace tried to pretty much blend in with the wallpaper. As Todd demanded that Troy take his shorts off then and there, Troy informed him that he would not be stripping down in front of everyone. That was when Ace cut in to have Troy's back, making the argument even worse. But Ace knew that Todd had quite a reputation for fighting and not losing. So in order to sort of prove himself to Troy, he jumped right into that argument. After a little more arguing, Troy and his girlfriend left again in Todd's shorts. Ace stayed behind, though. For some reason maybe because Troy had left without his backpack full of his personal and important items. Eventually, Todd and his date went back downstairs to go back at it. Ace, of course, stayed upstairs and kept company with Todd's pit bull. They all expected Troy and his girlfriend to return that night, at least for his backpack. But when everyone woke up the next morning, they realized that Troy and his girlfriend had not returned to the cabin. Everyone was puzzled as to what Troy was up to. 
but since Troy had left his cell phone in his backpack, they all just hung around the cabin and waited for Troy. The second night came and went with no word from Troy or his girlfriend. It wasn't until they got up on the third day with still no Troy that they finally started to really worry. Alarm bells were definitely going off for the trio. Todd decided to try and call Troy's girlfriend again, like he had the previous day when her phone seemed to be switched off. That day, it finally rang and she picked up. Fear would creep into her voice when she realized that Troy wasn't back at the cabin like she assumed he would have been. So, her and Todd agreed to start calling around to see if they could track down Troy. No one had heard from Troy at all. Next, a panicking Todd called a few friends up to the isolated cabin to help search the nearby woods for Troy. Not a single trace of Troy was found. It was Todd who made the decision to call Troy's girlfriend and have her report Troy missing. She did just that, but when asked of Troy's last known whereabouts, she gave them the honest answer. She told them that Troy was last seen at his cabin having a heated argument with Todd. The problem with that was that Todd had a pretty well-known reputation for fighting and not generally losing. At this point, in which the following events took place, Troy had been missing for three days so he was almost declared lost. Apparently, the cops decided they should take it very seriously. The following morning, Todd and his date and Ace were fast asleep, only to be startled awake to the sounds of both the front door being kicked in and people running around on the roof. The SWAT team flooded in, subduing the trio inside. At one point, one of the SWAT officers said, I will shoot you, and I will shoot that dog. Upon hearing that, Ace suddenly popped his face up from the floor and exclaimed, Why are you going to shoot the dog? Don't shoot the dog! Of course, the dog did not get hurt at all. What came next was the trio getting questioned by a couple of detectives, portraying in the usual good cop, bad cop scenario. Unfortunately for Todd, though, he was the last person seen with Troy, and they were arguing. Couple that with Todd's reputation for fighting, and well, that made Todd the number one and only suspect in Troy's disappearance. It also didn't help that the detectives had found some clothing left by the hot tub, and some of the clothing had drops of blood on it though Todd insisted that he didn't even know whose clothes they were. Search and Rescue came in next to comb the surrounding woods for any clues to Troy's whereabouts. They searched for hours while Todd, Ace, and Todd's date were continuing to be questioned, but they focused mainly on Todd. After hours of interrogation, Todd finally got irritated and insisted that since Troy had been missing for three days at that point, he could either be dead or alive, but they should be focusing their efforts on finding Troy. Oblivious to Todd and company was the fact that Search and Rescue had located Troy deep in the woods and hours away from his cabin. Troy was found passed out on a large rock, naked, and just hours away from his demise. The next thing that Todd, his date, Ace, and the detectives heard was the sound of search and rescue helicopters chopper blades cutting through the air, getting closer to the cabin. As they all peered out the door, they seen the approaching chopper with Troy suspended in a blue diaper-like thing from it. The chopper was looking for a safe place to lower Troy enough for emergency ground personnel to be able to reach him. As the smoke was still clearing on the whole situation a couple of days later, Todd was informed about the facts that led up to Troy's disappearance. Apparently, Troy and his girlfriend had left the cabin on the night he vanished to simply cool off after the argument 
with a nice walk in the woods that surrounded the cabin. But right before they left for that walk, Troy's girlfriend had stolen his debit card. Shortly after setting out on their walk, Troy and his girlfriend got into an argument themselves. They got separated after that. Troy's girlfriend ended up walking herself back to the main road. This is where she'd call a ride, leaving Troy in the woods and assuming he'd find his way back to the cabin. So basically, Troy's girlfriend turned her phone off for the next couple of days in order to avoid Troy's angry phone calls about his debit card while she got to party the whole time. When she finally did turn her phone back on, she received Todd's concerned call about Troy. She was shocked to learn that Troy had been missing for the last couple of days. Troy ended up being relatively okay, considering his circumstances. Todd ended up moving out of state shortly after, which pretty much dissolved that friendship. As far as Ace, Todd's date, and Troy's girlfriend, well, they're in the wind, I guess you could say. I'm almost positive, though, that none of the people involved in this story will ever be able to forget the events that took place over those fateful three days at the cabin. Each year, me and one of my closest friends, who we will call Dane, go down to visit his grandparents at their cabin in a nice, small, peaceful town here in the North Georgia mountains. Me, my friend, and his grandpa are all outdoors kind of people, so we were always looking for something fun for all of us to do around the area. One night, we decided to go explore some trails not too far from the cabin. Now, these aren't the kind of trails you're probably thinking of. They really are more of a gravel dirt road, but a lot of hunters, campers, motorbikers, and backpackers all use it. We headed out to the trail, and right as we pulled up to the trail that we were going to go on, we noticed an older, beat-up, suspicious-looking black Chevy SUV with two middle-aged men in it parked next to the entrance of the trail. Now, even though this is a safe area, drug deals and other kinds of sketchy activity can occur deep in these woods. So, we avoided going on that trail, decided to head down to another trail about a half mile down the road. We pulled out about 50 or so feet into the trail just outside of view from the road, parked the truck, got out, and started our exploration. Our little night hike was off to a great start, until we got about a mile in. We started to hear a dog bark from probably 300 feet away. We decided to keep going, but the dog would just not stop barking. We didn't know if it was the dog on a leash or not and could come and attack us. So, we decided to turn around and head back. Looking back, I'm really happy we turned around when we did. When we were about, I would say, a thousand or so feet away from the truck, we could see a car sitting behind my friend's grandpa's truck, running with its headlights on. This instantly made us worried, because who would just roll up behind a random truck at 10 o'clock at night on an isolated trail? And keep in mind, you would have had to drive into the trail to see where we parked the truck. It was not visible from the road. We stood there for about five minutes, trying to see if we could see anybody. But since it was so dark and pretty far away, it was hard to see anything. Fortunately for us, there was a pretty large tree next to the trail that we were able to stand behind, so there was no way they could see us from where they were parked. My friend's grandpa took these night vision binoculars we had with us to try and get a better look, but it was still not much help. We decided to just stand there and wait for them to turn around and leave. There was no chance we were going to walk back with this random car with potentially bad people in it sitting behind our truck. 
after about 10 minutes of just standing there, to my absolute horror, the car drives around the truck and starts to head down the trail in our direction. As fast as we could, we climbed up this hill right next to us and hid behind a log that was sitting up at the top. A few seconds later, the same beat-up black Chevy SUV we saw outside the other trail where we originally were supposed to hike on comes driving down where we were just standing not even 15 seconds ago. The car had its windows rolled down and started to slow down as it drove past us. Me, my friend, and grandfather were terrified. Our hearts were pounding out of our chest, and we were scared. These guys would stop and sit there, or even worse, get out and start looking for us. Fortunately, the car just kept driving and never stopped. As soon as the car was out of sight, we got out of our hiding spot, booked it back to the truck, and got out of there. I know this may not be as scary as some others, but it was definitely pretty frightening. We don't know who or what those guys wanted. My guess is they had a stash on that trail deeper in the woods and thought we stumbled upon it or something and were out there to confront us, or even worse. A lot of things could have gone wrong. We could have walked up to the truck just as they pulled in. What if they came out and looked for us? What if they slashed the tires to the truck? Or... What if they turned their headlights off and sat there and waited for us to come back? My friend and his grandfather actually went back in the daytime a few days later to the exact spot where we were hiding and took some pictures. I can only imagine what could have happened if we did not make it in time and those guys would have caught us. When I was about seven or eight, I had a disturbing encounter with some kind of creature or entity. I lived in the Appalachian mountain range of Pennsylvania. It was November, around when daylight saving time occurred. I remember it was supposed to be a school day, but since the snow was so heavy, the buses were not able to drive out in the morning. So, school was canceled for a snow day. I was so stoked to spend the rest of the day outside in the snow. We had an acre of property going quite far back into the woods. I was walking deep into the forest to a small frozen pond past my property line. All of a sudden, the woods went dead silent. No birds, no wildlife scurrying around, absolutely nothing. I remember thinking it was strange, but kept walking to make it to the pond. I should have turned around right then and there, but was just a stupid kid. After I reached the pond, everything seemed completely still and silent, and the hairs on the back of my neck felt as if they were rising. I began to get frightened, and I didn't know why. I just felt like something really bad was going to happen to me if I didn't leave at that moment. So I decided to run back home. As I arrived to my backyard, I realized it was so late and the sun was actually setting. My mother came running outside asking where I was literally all day and to never, ever disappear like that again. None of this made sense to me. I had only been outside for 20 minutes. I left my house with my snow gear on at around 10 in the morning, right after getting the snow day call. It was now almost 8 p.m., meaning I had been gone for 10 hours. I have no idea what happened or how I had been gone for such a long period of time. I remember only being out there for such a short period of time. I don't know if this was a skinwalker encounter or a wendigo encounter or something else like an alien. Has anyone else had this happen to them? Was it some kind of creature? I didn't see anything at all while out there. I didn't lose track of time. I didn't fall and hit my head or anything. What do you think happened?
The fear I felt that day will be forever burned into my memory. This happened in the early 90s, when I was in 5th grade. I had a black and white cat named Bucky. Bucky loved to be outside and would often disappear for a few days while roaming the neighborhood or woods behind my house. He would sometimes return with battle scars from his adventures. I remember fearing that someday he would meet an untimely demise due to his curiosity and fearlessness. Well, that demise finally came to fruition one early morning during my summer break. I was home alone when I received a phone call from my mother. It was around 10 that morning. I could hear in her voice that she was very upset. She told me the news that I had always dreaded. She found Bucky dead on the side of the road while leaving for work that morning. She had seen him in the glow of her car lights while exiting the neighborhood onto the busy road into town. She had then came back home, grabbed a garbage bag, scooped him up, and placed it in the garage. I was obviously upset, but not bawling my eyes out upset. Like I mentioned before, I knew something like this would happen one day. I told my mom I would take him and bury him in the pet cemetery out back in the woods. The pet cemetery was just a small clearing on my neighbor's land, where quite a few people in the neighborhood had also buried their pets. There was probably only about a dozen pets buried out there, with makeshift grave markers made of wood crosses or large stones. I solemnly walked out to the garage, and there in the corner, I saw the large black garbage bag. I didn't dare open it up and look inside. I had no idea what kind of condition he was in, nor did I want to know. I grabbed a shovel and the bag, and then headed off into the woods. Now, this was in the early 1990s, and just a few years earlier, the Stephen King movie Pet Cemetery had come out. I remember watching it on the VCR, with my dad and getting the crap scared out of me. I loved scary movies, but that one had a huge, terrifying impact on my young psyche. This movie absolutely was on my mind while I walked down the heavily wooded path on that hot summer day. And finally, there it was, slightly down a sloping hill on the edge of a swamp, the pet cemetery. I jabbed the shovel into the moist, leafy soil and began digging. I didn't dig far though, only about two feet down. I grabbed the garbage bag, lowered it into the shallow hole. I teared up a little bit and said my goodbye to Bucky. It only took a few moments to cover the hole up, and I grabbed a nearby stick to use as a temporary grave marker. I figured I'd make something a little more special for his grave later. I located the trail again and made the long, sad walk back home. A few hours went by. I was in the kitchen making a sandwich for lunch, doing whatever I could to take my mind off the loss of my beloved cat. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. Suddenly, I hear a long, drawn-out meow coming from the back door. I freeze in shock and I listen again. And there it was, another meow this time followed up by a rabid scratching at the back screen door, just like Bucky always did when coming home from an adventure. This can't be happening, I thought. Images from the movie flash into my brain, the cat from that movie returning from the dead as an evil reincarnation of itself, hissing and stinking of death. My heart pounded as I listened again, hoping it was just my imagination running wild. I walked into the family room, staring at the back door, and there it was again, a long, drawn-out meow, followed by a fury of scratching. I thought about calling my mother, but I couldn't wait 
I just had to open that door. I could hear my actual heartbeat ringing in my ears as I grabbed the handle of the back door and slowly opened it. I looked down and sure enough, there is Bucky. He is innocently looking up at me with a look of, hey, let me in, I'm hungry. He didn't look bloody, muddy, or like some kind of evil zombie cat like in the movie. He looked completely fine. So I let him in and he goes about his business and acts as if it's just another day. Bucky was his usual self and went to live on another couple of years before passing away. I've tried to rationalize this in my brain so many times, and there is one very legit and logical explanation for what actually happened that day. In the early pre-dawn darkness, my mom saw a dead cat on the side of the road that looked very similar to my cat, and since my cat had been gone overnight, assumed this was Bucky. I then proceeded to drag this random cat back into the woods and bury it in the pet cemetery. All the while, good old Bucky was just outside on one of his adventures, oblivious to this disturbing misidentification that had taken place. A few days later, I did actually go back to the cemetery and observed that the fresh grave that I had dug to still be completely undisturbed. I mean, that has to be what happened, right? I mean, there's only one other alternative to what happened that day, and I'd rather not believe that my cat came back from the dead after getting buried in the pet cemetery. I was 11 years old when my family moved to a new town. It didn't take long before I made a new friend down at the end of the block. Her house was located on the corner of a T intersection that dead ended into a field with lots of trees and a tiny shallow stream. My friend and I sometimes played there, but generally did not go more than 20 feet into the wooded property. There wasn't much wooded land as probably about 50 or so feet on the other side was a road that was not connected to ours, and we knew that was farther than we were allowed to go. The stream was about five inches deep, and we did have fun playing within eyesight of my friend's house. We never saw anybody else there, and we never had any problems. Another new addition to the block resides myself. Another new addition to the block, besides myself, was a man in his 20s, who was just recently married. He moved in across from my friend. He was a nice man and a firefighter. His wife was kind to us and let us play with her cat a couple of times a week. One day, while playing in the stream, we ventured farther than usual. I don't remember why, but we weren't really paying attention to our surroundings. We didn't make it very far because the stream petered out, becoming muddy and full of dead leaves. We were about to turn back when in a small clearing just before us, we saw something unusual, something dark and flying or hovering in midair. We made our way forward cautiously to get a better look. As I strained my eyes in the gloom of the trees, it blurred my vision around me, becoming a hazy background of orange, yellow, and red, punctuated by the deep black of wet tree bark peeking out here and there. The October air was crisp and clean, but the weak sun failed to penetrate the meager but complete canopy of dying leaves overhead. Before long, the black thing before me began to take shape and I soon saw that it was not hovering over the clearing like I thought. It was hanging by a wire. My eyes traveled up the wire to where it was wrapped around a branch that jutted out over the clearing. Still not understanding what exactly I was seeing, I let my eyes travel down the wire to the black object. 
The wire was wrapped around what I soon realized was the leg of an animal. The wire was being used to suspend the animal quite low, in clear view of anyone under six feet tall. It was so low that any adults could easily reach it without the need of a ladder. Without thinking, we went closer to discover that it was not originally the color black. It was black because it was charred. It looked sooty and greasy with patches of orange fur. The animal, now looking very much like a cat, had been murdered and burned. Yes, now I'm wondering if it was burned alive, but that didn't occur to me back then, thank God. My friend and I looked at each other with shock. She was scared to death, her face pale, and her eyes wide. I'm sure I looked pretty much the same to her, and without a word, we turned around and hightailed it straight out of the trees, past the stream, and out onto the street. We confirmed with one another that we both just saw a burned dead cat hanging from a tree. We agreed we needed to tell an adult right away. It made sense to go to the new neighbor since he was a fireman, second only in authority to a policeman, and his wife was always home during the day. Their house was also close to the end of the street where we were playing, and well, they had a cat. We knocked on his door, and the fireman answered and asked us what was going on. We told him what we had just seen and that he needed to come look. He took us seriously and, looking concerned, pulled on his jacket and stepped out the door. We took him through the small wooded area along the stream to the clearing. There he saw what we saw, a charred cat hanging from a wire from a tree branch over the clearing. I could see he was shocked by the sight of the charred body, and he began looking closer at our surroundings, which was something my friend and I had not done. Then he suddenly exclaimed, Girls, be careful. We looked around, expecting to see more burned cats or a person, but instead... We found that he was pointing to areas on the ground and at the trees. He instructed us not to move and kneeled down to show us more wire. There was a lot of it, and I followed his finger as he traced its path from one tree to another, making a perimeter around the clearing. It was wrapped around the tree trunks about one foot from the ground, meant to make whoever wanted to get close to trip and fall. He then stood up, pointing to pieces of metal in the trunks of the trees. They were razor blades, he said, set into the bark of each tree, sharp edge facing out. Our fireman friend said they were put there so someone would cut themselves if they tripped on the wire and tried to catch themselves on a tree trunk. It was a trap. The cat was bait, he explained. It was bait for a human, though, meant to catch a person's attention and lure him into the clearing in order to cause them harm. I didn't understand why, and when I asked, he said he didn't know. I asked if the cat was his. He said he did not know. There's more to the story than we were ever told, bad enough to make the firemen move away only months after moving in. I had never seen anything like this before, and it took me a long time to understand the level of hatred and malevolence that was behind the act of murdering and burning my neighbor's cat. Not to mention the illness of someone who would booby trap an area against innocent children. It was scary but also surreal and had left quite an impression on my young mind. Whatever was going on, whether it was meant for us, kids, or neighbor, or someone else, I hope to never see such a thing again. This story takes place at the house I lived in with my family for a majority of my life. This is my experience. My siblings and mother had other experiences living here. 
We rented and moved into a new house when I was around 9 years old and left when I was 15. The owner had a dresser he was wondering if we wanted before he threw it away. My mother agreed and placed it into my room so I had more room for my growing collection of clothing. The house was one floor, decent sized, and you could hear when someone was walking from the complete opposite end of the house. My room was next to my sister's, which was the last door down the hallway. The bathroom was to my left, and further up was a break-off where my mother slept, and across was my brother's room, then the front door was adjacent. The kitchen was directly opposite my sister's room down the hallway next to my mother's room, the kitchen, without a door blocking it off. Connected to the lounge area, which had a sliding door, which to our medium-sized backyard, which held another room. I'd call it a granny flat, but we threw junk in there because it had asbestos no one could sleep in there. From my room, I could see a portion of the garage, the whole backyard and the lounge area. But beyond the lounge room, there was a short hallway that had a door to another room. We used it as a gaming room, enough to fit a single person, and a laundry was at the end of the hallway that opened to the backyard also. I'm giving a layout to better get an understanding of the layout of the house, to give a visual representation. Most of these occurrences are very blurred with how old I was and the years difference, so bear with me. I was probably roughly 13 when this happened. My bed was in the back corner of the room. I had a gap and against the wall was the dresser. The dresser had one side that would open randomly for some reason. I would place a padlock on it so it wouldn't open. I mean, I never locked it, I didn't have a key, and it did the job I needed it to. It was very late. I was in bed trying to sleep when I heard fingernails scratching down the door. I felt chills go up my spine as I lay listening to it happening over and over. Soon, I realized there was heavy breathing echoing out of the old dresser. I ignored it and fell back to sleep. But the next night... The same thing happened. I tried to sleep. I heard the nails, but I heard my dresser click and opened slowly as it made a loud creaking noise when it opened. I knew the sound well because it opened every time the padlock was not holding it shut. I lay feeling my body slightly shake. I knew I had put that padlock on the door. I do it every night. I remember looking towards the door, and where my clothes usually are, was complete, horrifying darkness. I felt all my anxieties rise inside me as my eyes widened. I felt freezing. I heard a deep exhale, and my eyes watered from fear as I stare into whatever it was. I hid under the covers, closed my eyes trying my best to calm my breathing. I woke up the next morning, sat up, like I forgot what had happened, and it all rushed back to me when I saw the padlock on my bedside table and the door to the wardrobe open. Another incident happened when my mother left the house with my siblings. I was home alone. I took a swig of water, lifted my cup, placed it onto the counter. I felt a weird chill and heard shuffling from the gaming room, the room I felt the spirits in my house were. It was always a lot colder than the rest of our house, and I always felt eyes staring at me. I stepped back, heard the door to that room creaking open. I felt my body tremble, and I bolted from my room. I slammed my door shut, locked it, and sat on my bed against the wall. Silence. I hear a thump, 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 crash. I jumped at that sound, like glass hitting wood. I 
I wish I recorded this, but I only had bad technology and was scared out of my mind. This was before everybody filmed their whole life and at the ready with a phone. It started slow. When you begin to run in a startup, it ran from the sound where the glass shattered right to my door. Heavy, loud, angry footsteps charging right for me. It felt as if everything was closing in on me, and it smacked right into my door like an angry animal. I jumped, tried to hide further back, but there was nowhere to go. I sat there for a while, messaging my mother after a long time of silence. I hear the front door open, loud conversations and my mother calling out to me to help. She walked into the kitchen, me behind her, and the glass I drank out of lay on the floor, broken. The last incident that was imprinted into my brain was the night I woke up, groggy and confused as I heard shuffling through these open square-shaped boxes I had containing books, papers, my phone, etc. I rolled over and saw a dark figure with long hair going through my things. I called out my brother's name and there's no reply. I called to my mother, no reply. I sat up slightly, cleared my throat, and it clicked as it stared right at me. Darkness covering its face, hair a crazy mess, and it was tall. It stood up tall, and the heavy breathing swarmed me. I threw the covers over my head and rolled over, crying at this point and shaking. I tried to calm myself and eventually fell asleep. They are the three main things that happened over the years. But there were always footsteps, eyes on me, scratching, and sometimes someone would touch me in my sleep. The scariest thing in that wardrobe, messily cut into it, was a name I only remember, Elizabeth. But it's been a long time since I lived there and I'm in a new house which gives me the creep sometimes, but not as bad as that house. I compiled two different theories. A man who ran around the house in boots and a woman in my bedroom. I don't know if the people now living there have issues, but I am glad I'm out of there and glad they did not follow me if they could. When my brother and I were really, really young, I remember my mother taking us to our mountain house all the time. We hated it because most of the time she made us go and none of our friends were there. So we were bored mostly. She would tell us it's for our own good. The air up there is much better than in our polluted city, which is true. Nowadays, I really love going up there, except now. I go with my friends and it's always fun. One time, when we were up there, I think we were 13 or 14, I remember being really bored, so I convinced my mother to let me and my brother go out and explore the woods behind the home. We didn't go in that deep, and next to the trail in the woods nearby, I noticed a fallen tree that made a perfect little hiding spot. It was like a tree house, but was built there. It was basically just a tree that was knocked down, and its branches resembled a roof, and underneath there was a little bit of grass. I figured we could bring a blanket, and it would be our little tree house. The next day, we brought our equipment. I prepared a blanket, some decorations made of paper, and a few glasses if we got thirsty my brother brought some toys so we wouldn't be so bored. We spent all of our time in the treehouse from then on. We would go back to the house occasionally so that my mother wouldn't get too worried. One day, our neighbor came to his cottage and we showed him our house in the woods as well. He was pretty amazed by it, but his parents didn't let him stick around for long. Now that we have made this discovery, we didn't really want to go home anymore, but we had to go to school and mom promised us we would come back again for the weekend. I literally couldn't wait for all the upcoming weekends 
so that we could go back and work on our house. Every time we went there, we would build it a little bit more and add things to it. Now about two months later, my mother and I went to the mountains alone. My mother didn't really want me to go into the woods alone, but I managed to convince her that I would just be fine. As I was approaching my little treehouse, I noticed a black coat through the branches, and I got a little confused because I don't remember that we left any coats in there. When I got to my house, I froze in fear because the coat turned out to be a person sitting in my treehouse. It was an older man in his late thirties, and he was just as surprised to see me as I was him. He asked me what I was doing there, and I explained that the house and everything inside belonged to me and my brother. The man found it very cute and said he wouldn't touch anything, and he just needed somewhere to rest for a while because he had traveled a long way. I was a little scared and I said goodbye to the man and hurried back home. When I got out of the woods, I ran and told my mom all about our house and what happened. She was mad, especially because she didn't seem to know the man I described and really anything could have happened. I was never going to go there alone again and I was scared I couldn't sleep the entire night. Me and my mom were alone in the cottage. I kept imagining the man knocking on our doors and doing something. Me and my brother went to the house with my mother again to pick up our things, but they were all ruined because it had rained at some point. My mother gave us a long lecture about doing things without her knowing. There was no one there when we went and no trace of the man I saw previously. We did hear an animal that my mother could not identify in the distance. It was like it was screaming in pain and it was really creepy. So we went back to the cottage. My mom forbid us ever going back again or even approaching the woods, and for good reason. A few months went by, and my family was watching the news one night when a picture of a man appeared. It said that he was the main suspect in the murder of a woman, who was apparently his wife, and that he had been missing for two months now. I almost threw up when I realized why that man looked so familiar. It was the guy I saw in our treehouse that day when I went there alone. I told my mom right away and she called the police to report a sighting. As the newsman kept talking, I was more and more grateful to God that he saved me from anything that could have happened that day. I mean, I was only a 13 year old girl and the man could have easily done something to me or hurt me especially because he was on the run from police and I had already seen him. If my mom had reported him that day when I told her about what had happened, they would have definitely caught him. But something stopped her from doing that, just like something probably stopped the man from killing me. He definitely knew that I was a big liability and that I could get him caught, but he still decided to let me go. My family was very invested in this investigation and seeing if they could ever catch him. To this day, the man has not been found and the case is not closed. Even now, 10 years later, I still get nightmares and can't sleep. I still feel like he's out there somewhere.